I love cows. I love cows. They're great. Um, I, um, and, and there's a lot of life lessons one can learn on a farm. Lessons of faith. Lessons of hard work. The multiple seasons of life, right? I mean, there's all kinds of truths and lessons we can learn uh, on a farm. But when it comes to watching cows and hanging with the cows, how they act and how they behave, I can honestly say that the most valuable of all of life's lessons that I have learned while watching the cows, if I were to number them, are absolutely zero. Absolutely zero. I have no life lessons that I have learned or picked up from watching cows. The only thing that I have learned is that they eat a lot, and they do some other things a lot, and they scare very easily. And as a kid growing up, I had a lot of fun with that, spooking the cows. My grandpa, I know, would like to tan my hide uh, if he would have caught me uh, spooking the cows. But, you know, cows, I, I, they, I just think they're funny. I always like the Chick-fil-A commercials. You know, I always get a kick out of that. But, but I learned nothing about watching, from watching cows or observing cows. However, in Exodus 32, I think there are some very valuable lessons that we can learn today and for the next week or two when it comes from, and it comes from a story about a cow. Well, actually, a calf. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 32, that's the second book of the Bible, all the way in the beginning. Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 32. And as you're turning there, let me give some context into our passage today. At this point, the Hebrew people have been mightily delivered and, and, uh, and saved from Egyptian slavery by the power of God's hand through the leadership of Moses, his servant Moses, and Aaron. The development of a people, God's people, his chosen people by, by himself to be his vessels, to take his light to the rest of the world is well underway in this, by this time. In Egypt, God displayed his awesome power and his awesome might when he overcame the, uh, much of the, uh, the believed in deities of Egypt. Their gods that they bowed down to, the idols that they worshipped, were made to look like mere children's toys in comparison to God's mighty hand. God performed miracles that put away all the doubt of whose God was more powerful. God totally decimated Pharaoh's army in the Sea of Reeds, or what we typically call the Red Sea. At this, the Hebrew people Rejoice! They, they celebrated the power of God and they rejoiced in the deliverance that he gave to them and, the, and, and they rejoiced at the hope that was theirs because of their sure future in God as he would lead them. Now, there were some murmurings that occurred early on in spite of God's display of power and his display of awesome uh, majesty. There were some murmurings, there were some complainings and isn't that just like us? When we, uh, shortly after, that's why I say our, we have short-term memory in so many different ways. But there were some, some uh, murmurings occasionally shortly after their deliverance concerning food and water. But God, once again, in his faithfulness, proved himself to be a faithful provider. There were some, some attacks from foreigners uh, as Israel was traveling. They, they were attacked by a foreign enemy. But God showed that he was with them by giving them victory over these armies, these invading armies. Three months after Egypt, three months after the deliverance of Egypt, from Egypt, the people come to Mount Sinai. And it is here that God will give his command, his laws. He will give his commandments to his chosen people so that they may know his heart and that they may know what God expects of his people, this chosen instrument to be his light to the rest of the world. In Exodus chapter 19, Moses, uh, Moses and God are having an ongoing, continual conversation. God is instructing him to prepare the Hebrews, to prepare uh, the Israelites 
to meet with him, to meet God. And that God instructs Moses to set boundaries around the mountain lest they get too close and they die because of his, his uh, awesome power that is going to be displayed. On the third day, the people were, were to prepare to witness God's voice speaking to Moses. They were to hear God. They saw his awesome power. They saw his awesome miracles and might exercised in Egypt when they were living in Egypt. But now, for the first time, they were going to be able to hear his voice speaking to Moses. And this was to solidify to the people God's choosing of Moses so that they would begin to trust and rely and depend on Moses or they could, they could believe Moses that he was God's man for the job that God had in store for Israel. Exodus chapter 20, Moses is in the presence of God. And God is giving him the Ten Commandments and instructs him to tell the people. He gives them all kinds of instructions beyond just the Ten Commandments. And then Moses tells the people, he instructs them. And it says, when the people saw it, they trembled and they stayed at a distance. What were they seeing? They were seeing the manifestations of God's presence on the mountain. The thunder and the lightning, the hail, the wind, the storm, the fire. All these things. These spectacular, this spectacular scene was displaying God's power and his glory. And it says, when the people saw it, they trembled and stayed at a distance. And they said to Moses. Now remember this verse. They said to Moses, speak with us yourself. And we'll listen. But don't let God speak with us, lest we die. I mean, they were terrified of what they were seeing. But Moses assures them, he says to the people, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be frightened by what you're seeing. Don't be frightened by what you're experiencing. For God has come to test you. And that his fear may be before you. That you'd stand in all of his might. That you won't sin. That you, you will not turn away from these words that I'm giving to you this day. And it says the people stayed at a distance. In other words, I believe it implies they remained in their fear. And they remained closed to God's voice. From here, God continued to give instruction to Moses to declare to the people. And so Moses continues to declare God's word to the people. He himself proclaims it to them. And it says the people respond by saying in verse 3 of chapter 20, And all the people answered with one voice, All the words which the Lord had spoken will do. All the words that the Lord has spoken will do. That day, Moses performed a ritual signifying God's setting apart the people as his chosen instruments. And after the ritual, God calls Moses to come up to the mount where God would give Moses the laws on the stone tablets. He would, he would carve out the stone on the stone tablets, his law with his own finger, it says. And Moses, it says, was on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. And then that's where we come to chapter 32 of Exodus. And it says in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 32, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they felt that he was severely delayed. It says they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened. To him. What's the very first observation that we see in this verse? What I mean, what is happening in the mindset of the people? Any any takers? What's the very first thing that we observe in this in, in, in regards to the mindset of the people? Impatient. Why were they impatient? What were they doing? What was going through their mind? What were they thinking? What were they wondering? Where, where's Moses? What happened to Moses? I mean, 40 days, he was up on the mountain. I mean, he, that's over a month. And so we might be able to reason, we might be able to justify, well, you know what, what would we do? Would we be growing impatient? Well, probably. 
But neither of us, anybody, I don't think anybody in this room had seen or witnessed the display of God's glory and might as, the, as Israel did, their deliverance from Egypt. The people were wondering, where was Moses? And this leads to speculation, perhaps. Maybe they were thinking, did he die? Did he die going up the mountain? Maybe he, I mean, there's sharp edges and there's, there's narrow passageways. Maybe he stumbled and he fell off the mountain to his death. Maybe he's trapped somewhere and he, he can't, maybe he's fallen and he can't get up. I don't know. He needs life alert or something. I don't know. But where, you know, they're, they're speculating. Who's going to lead us? And the interesting thing that I was thinking about whenever I was reading this was, what if, let's just say something did happen to Moses. Let's just say he died. You know, he fell off the cliff. Don't you think, you would think the people, after seeing all that they saw, after witnessing all that they'd witnessed, you would think, well, God could certainly raise up somebody else. But instead, we see them taking matters into their own hands. Instead, we see them taking control. All that they'd witnessed, in, in the con- that's why I was giving the context of Israel's experience up to this point, all they had witnessed the- by God through Moses. You know, they say seeing is believing, They say seeing is believing, right? But I say that's all dependent upon how much time goes by. Just like what we talked about 9-11 and and any of these these major atrocities that have happened or tragedies that have happened in in our lives or or in our country or wherever. We tend to forget, given enough time, the passion of our remembrance tends to to die down. The fire of our remembrance tends to, to, to smolter. Given enough time, even if we see, no matter how much we have seen, no, no matter how great the object that we have seen, given enough time, our belief can still be, is, it is still not enough to safeguard against doubt and unbelief. And if people of Israel, with all that they saw, Still, yet only three months out after, after the li- deliverance of Egypt, still faltered with doubt and unbelief. I w- would dare to say seeing is not necessarily believing. And so now we find Israel, the people, they are now in panic mode and they're confused. Why? I think it's because they put more weight into what they saw and what or who they fixed their eyes on rather than into what they heard. They put more weight into what they saw or who they saw or who they were looking at, who they had their eyes fixed on rather than into what they heard. Seeing may spark a resemblance of belief as long as what is seen remains in sight. But in order to obtain an enduring faith that weathers the storms of life, it requires hearing. Paul said this in Romans chapter 10. Faith, faith, enduring faith, comes by hearing. And hearing what? The word of God. What did the Israelites say to Moses concerning God? Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. We see you. We're going to fix our eyes on you. You speak to us and we'll listen. But don't let God speak with us lest we die. I mean, did not the people already declare their commitment to do all that the Lord had said? All the Lord had said? But that vow seems to be dependent and rest upon The presence of Moses. Because that's who they had their eyes fixed on. How much of our spiritual stability, how much of our peace about our circumstances depend upon the things that we see versus what we hear from God himself. From God himself. The truth is, the way of sight is the way of the world, of God. 
The world looks and seeks to see things in order to believe. God calls his people to be people who hear. Not to walk by sight, but by faith. And faith comes by hearing. Seeing the way of sight is not the way of God. And so when the people of God allow their peace to depend upon their sight, rather than on what God has spoken to them directly through his word, they are more like the world than they are like God. And the reality is, people let people down. Because how often do we put our eyes on people? How often do we put our eyes on people? Either our faith, our stability rests in this person. When this person goes, so does my faith. My world is shook. I always found it interesting whenever, uh, and it, it's, it's like this, it seems to be like this in every church. When a pastor leaves, there's, there, there seems to be a, a, an exodus of people who leave, at least for a time, because the pastor left. Why? Was their whole reason why they were there, did it, was it tied to that pastor? Were their eyes on God, or was their eyes on, on the pastor, on the, on the person? Sometimes we make excuses on why, well, I don't, I don't, I don't go to God, uh, to God or I don't go to church anymore uh, because this person, because of, because of this person. Who, who are our eyes on, that person or on God? Does our faith rest in God, in God alone and what his word says, or does my faith rest in that person? People let people down. The people fix their eyes upon Moses rather than tuning their ears to hear God's voice. And Moses comes up missing, so they speculate. The person that they fixed their eyes on, that they, they rested their, their faith on, that they set their ears to listen to, he is gone. He's nowhere to be found. And so what takes place? Their world is rocked. Their confidence in God's plan is shook, and they're overcome with fear. What does our faith look like when we see change take place? When we see things happen that we don't understand, what does our faith look like? Does our faith remain unmoved, unshaken, or does our faith become shaky? Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. What's heaven and earth? Those are things that we see. Those are objects that we see. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, the things that, the thing, that which we hear, will never pass away. Speak with us yourself, Moses, and we will listen, but don't let God speak with us lest we die. This is a very insightful statement about, I believe, why a lot of people don't want God to speak to them directly lest we die. People don't want to hear from, some, sometimes we don't want to hear from God, lest we die. We might, what might need to change in me if I would open my heart to listen to God's voice? What in my nature, what in my demeanor and my spirit needs to die if I were to open my ears to listen to God's voice in my life. Mark Twain was well known to say, it is not the things that I don't understand about the Bible that trouble me. There's a lot of things we don't understand about the Bible, but that's not what troubles me. But it's the things I do understand that trouble me. Because it speaks to what needs to die in my spirit. It speaks to what needs to change. And we don't do well with change. The demand of the people to Aaron to make for them a God who could go before them was a mere indication that the people were more interested in having a God who was more manageable to their comfort zone than a God who they were required to trust. When Moses with Moses, there was at least the chance that they could manipulate him, and they did try numerous times, just like they manipulated Aaron. You see, when our eyes are focused on...
But we, they're, they're more manageable. But when, whenever we open our ears to God, there's no fooling God. There's no facades or masks that we can wear that will hide our true intent from God. And when his voice speaks to us, we either will bow in awe and wonder of his presence and his mercy and his grace because God spoke to Moses that day and the people were petrified. Moses says, don't be afraid. I think what Moses is trying to convince the people, don't be afraid. Bow down and worship him in his awesomeness. Bow down and surrender. Give yourselves over to this God who's delivered you from the bondage of Egypt. The one who, who delivered you and, and helped you to walk on dry ground across the, 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 the sea of reeds. He is the God who is before you and behind you. He is the God who is with you. You do not need to be afraid of his voice. Listen to his voice. Allow yourself to be lost in him. But rather than that, they demanded, no, we don't want God to speak to us. We want you to speak to us, Moses. What led to the people to seek an idol over trusting in the God who had shown himself faithful was due to the fact that they refused to hear God's voice for themselves. That's what led them to create a God that they could manage because they refused to listen to God's voice for themselves. They had not developed and were not able to develop a faith that would sustain them through shifting circumstances and the storms of uncertain days because they refused to listen. Therefore, their faith was unable to develop. Are you listening? Are you hearing what, what I'm saying? What led to them to seek other things to worship, what other idols to put their trust in was because they closed their ear off to God's voice and they, they were not able to develop their faith. And that would be the thing that would have sustained them through the wilderness, through the desert, through the dryness of life. We have to open our ears to his voice. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning as we close in a, a song, Breathe. It's a song that, um, and, um, and, uh, and as we'll just close however the Lord, um, however the Lord leads. There's going to be a lot more said uh, concerning the, uh, this section of Scripture in the days to come, but I felt it was pertinent for us to recognize some foundational truth about this story about uh, this calf. What led to this? What, what leads us to abandon our, our trust in God? Well, sometimes we get our eyes on people. Sometimes we, we would rather listen to what the culture is saying. Sometimes we'd rather listen to what the majority of the people or say the crowd, the, the majority of the crowd is saying, and we just follow the, the winds of the crowd. But God calls us to listen to his voice. Are we willing to approach the mountain? Are we willing to approach the mountain and surrender? It is through Christ that we are able to approach the throne of grace. If God is speaking to you, if there's anything you need to pray about, we, this, this is a safe place. The altars are open. You can come and you can pray. You can pray right in your seat, wherever you're at. But let's be sure. Let's not leave this place without being confident that, yes, I, I am opening my ears to God's voice speaking to my life. Lord, speak. What, what, did, what did Samuel say to the Lord? What was he instructed to say by Eli? He was instructed to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Let's be listening to the Lord. Let's just worship the Lord as we uh, for all the service to the
direction without your voice. God, may we not, may we not close our ear to listen, to hear your voice speaking to us. May we not be distracted with what we see in our circumstances. May we not fix our eyes on people other than Christ himself. May our eyes be fixed on him who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the shepherd of our soul. He is the guide of our of our journey, Lord. Help us to listen to you. Lest lest those idols be given precedent in our lives. And so, Father, may you help your people not to walk by sight, but to walk by faith in this life. We give you the thanks and the peace. For it is in the name of Christ that we pray. And God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated.